folks, welcome to The Broken Meeple. This is another how to play tutorial video as requested by many viewers. Now just a quick recap of the YouTube channel as it current states. You may have noticed that I recently put in a post saying that I was going to cease doing unboxing videos. This is because I, well for several reasons. One, unboxing videos just really aren't getting the views these days. Not many people really want them and people can easily find out about the components of games on Board Game Geek or via how to play videos like this. So it kind of defeated the point of me actually making them. Secondly, uh, to do an unboxing video, I have to open the box literally from brand new. Now when I've acquired several games, that means the games have to sit on my shelf in their shrink wrap waiting for me to do the video. When really, I just want to be like the schoolboy on Christmas Day who gets to open up his presents in the morning. You know, I like to get out my game and go, ooh, look at all the shinies inside, that kind of thing. So I hated the fact that I had to leave these games there for ages before I did a video. So unboxing videos will now cease, which means that the channel is now going to be 95% devoted to how to play videos and reviews. Occasionally I might do a storage solution video every now and again, but I'm not an expert when it comes to custom inserts, so it's really more just a case of if I happen to have found a particular storage box that's quite good, I'll mention it. If there's a game which I think if you organize it in a particular way it's easier to set up and play, that kind of thing, then I'll post a quick video up for that. But those will be very sort of rare, not particularly often, and you know that won't be the focus of the channel. People really like my reviews and people really want to see more of these how to plays because I really have got a bit behind on these. So let's start off now and kick these how to play videos back into gear. Now what you see before you is Alien Frontiers the 4th edition. I have set it up for a two player game. Now the difference in players mainly dictates how many colonies that you have to play with which are these little dome things here. And also, it also dictates what spaces are available on the board. So you will notice that some spaces have got these little cardboard chits over certain spaces. Basically, they just cover up the spaces so they don't get used in the game. It scales with players. I've set it up for two players on the basis that I can go through the turns a bit quicker. And also, it means that I can actually show you what each player has in their particular so arsenal you could say or their storage because I wouldn't be able to fit four players around this camera view. Now what I'm going to do is that first I'm going to go through Alien Frontiers 4th edition and then eventually I'm going to do a how to play video on Kingsburg. That's because my recent review compared the two games and people will no doubt want to ask what, how does each one play. You know they're very similar but they also have their differences. So I figured a how to play video on Alien Frontiers and Kingsburg would sort out those problems. So without further ado, let's make a start on Alien Frontiers. I'm now going to get started by just telling you about the setup. Okay, the setup is relatively straightforward. First of all, you have the board. Then you have the cardboard chits that I mentioned, which cover up any spaces with dots on them. The dots represent what number of players, the, the basically, depending on how many players you play with, two, three, or four, you have to cover up certain spaces in order to balance the game out. So there's nothing particularly grating about that. Aside from that, each player in the two player game is going to take three of his dice, which represent his ships, and the other three will be placed in the maintenance bay for use, perhaps later, if they build more ships. They will then also take each one will take eight of their colony tokens, which are these really, really cool little dome, plas plastic dome things, very like retro sci-fi style colonies, much better than the smarties they had in the previous version. And they will also take one alien tech card at random from the alien tech deck. I will get onto those more in detail later. Aside from that, all you need is the alien tech deck shuffled and placed near the board and three, hopefully you can see these okay there, three alien tech cards dealt, oh, see if I can get that, there you go, see those three at the top? These three alien tech cards are there for people to buy or cycle through later. You will want these near the table, which represent the districts that you could, well, say districts, the areas of the moon, the planet, that you are trying to control over the course of the game, and each one just basically has the name and the special ability written in more detail 
and the board has the sort of a, like abbreviated version, you could say. These are purely just to represent who has control of a particular area and give you some more insight as to what the ability does. So they're more of a reference guide than anything else, but they're useful to have. Aside from that, you will want your ore and fuel tokens, which are these, frankly, not as great as the colonies. These basically wooden blocks. Now, I keep them all in a nice little Tubware box. You can get uh, six or seven of these. I think you can get six of these in a set for a quid from Poundland. Uh, and they're very useful for holding components. I highly recommend grabbing them. They are, And there's also these little mini square ones that you can get from them, like a pound for eight to 12 of them that are really small. But if you've only got to hold a little thing at the side, you know, maybe for something like Agricola or Cavernum, perhaps, if you can fit them in there, then they work an absolute treat. Anyway, you will also need your point scoring track over here and the little rocket ships for each player down at zero. And other than that, you simply dish out one fuel token to whoever is going second. Now in the three and four player variant, there is also a rule for like, like next place, one player goes first, next player gets a fuel token, next one gets an ore token, that kind of thing. It's to balance out the negatives of not going first. Other than that, the last thing you have to do is just place this die, which is a clear die, so not coloured, in the centre of the board. That's because this area in the middle relates to this die. It's a special ship that you can buy later. Aside from that, that is it. That is how you set up the game. So let's make a start with explaining a bit more about how this game works. Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay from this side of the camera. I will try and talk a bit louder so that it picks up my voice okay. But first, I just want to give a brief overview of how this game runs. The idea is, is that it's a worker placement game, but instead of placing workers, you have your dice, which represent your ships, or AKA workers. Now, it's not just simply a case of stick the die on the board and do the action. You have to roll the dice, and depending on what you roll, will give you the options of where you can place your ships. Each of these areas around the board edge represent places that you can dock your ships in order to gain special abilities. Oh, don't move the chip there. And the idea is, is that they have restrictions on the dice that can be placed there based on the numbers you've rolled, the sequential order, and they may give more benefits on the higher values, more benefits on the lower values, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to go into a brief explanation of what each of these areas does. So bear with me with the camera work. This is still a learning process. So let's move over to over there and move to the solar converter. Whoop, here we go. And there we go. That'll do. Right, the solar converter there at the top left is where you dock your ships when you need fuel. It's half the value of the die rounded up to dictate what fuel you'll get. So if you put a one or a two there, you get one fuel. Three or four, you get two fuel. Five or six, you get three fuel. Pretty straightforward, and there's quite a lot of spaces there. The orbital market over here is where you can trade um, fuel in order to get ore. So depending, you have to roll two dice that are of equal value. So you can see the equals value there. That represents that the dice must be the same value. Now, depending on what dice you put there represents the ratio of fuel that you trade for ore. So let me give you an example. Let's say I roll a, let's say I just roll one and one. That's the optimal way you can do it. I place my two ships there, and I trade one fuel for one ore. And you can do this multiple times. Let's say I rolled threes instead and place them there. That means it would cost me three fuel to get one ore. So obviously you can tell that you want the lower values for the orbital market. Move those out of the way. Uh, the terraforming station, which I'll go here because it's in camera view, is a special one where you are able to pay one fuel and one ore to place a colony on this planet. However, one, you need to roll a six, so it has to be a six, and the red arrow there means that you lose the dice. Normally, when it's your turn again, you get all your dice back and you re-roll them. But if you use the terraforming station, you're basically changing your ship into one of the colonies for this planet. So you have to be prepared to either lose the dice for a couple of turns, or make sure you can build it relatively quickly. Now, moving over to the right-hand side, we have, there we go, there we are, the Adian Artifacts. Now this is where you get a lot more of these tech cards up here and mess around with the deck. 
First of all, every time you place a dice down here, you can cycle the cards. That means that you discard the three that are showing there. Oop, can I pan up a bit? There you go. Yeah, there's three cards there. So going here, placing one die will mean that you can discard all of these and draw another three. Basically, if you don't like what you see, you have another try of getting some better ones or denying other players them. The other part, though, is that if you place two dice there that equal a total of equal or greater to eight, you may take one of these cards and place it in front of you. Now, these cards can give you victory points, allow you to augment die rolls, screw over other players. They have a wide variety of useful abilities, and they are not to be underestimated. You could base your strategy around getting a ton of them, like I did in my first game, but you can also just try and grab the ones that are useful to you, or even just discard the ones that you think your opponent's going to want. So that's the alien artifact. Moving on down, we have whoop, we have the raider's outpost. Now this is a slightly special one because normally when you place a dice on the board, you cannot shift the dice until it's your next turn. So it means that if, say, Green wanted to place dice there, he couldn't because your dice are blocking it. However, with the Raider's Outpost, you have to place your dice in sequential order going upwards. So that's what the plus one means. So I have to place a one there, I have to place a two there, and I have to place a three there. I could alternatively do two, three, four, three, four, five, four, five, six, and you get the idea. The special rule with this one, though, is that unlike the other bases, the other players can knock you off it and use the station again. However, they have to place a sequential order that is greater than your one. So I've placed one, two, three there. If green comes by and decides that he wants to do a, let's say, three, four, five, he can bonk my ships off to the maintenance bay and stick his on there and use it for himself. Let's grab those back. Raider's Outpost allows you to steal a mixture of four resources from any number of players. It doesn't have to be the same one. Uh, or steal a tech card from an... It's very nasty. It's a very sort of... This is like the game's biggest take that element. And you can really mess over some players who have been stockpiling resources. But then, that's the problem they have for stockpiling resources. Moving on down, we have the Lunar Mine. Now you'll see a couple of these spaces are covered up for two-player games. The Lunar Mine, first dice you place can be whatever number you like, doesn't matter, 1 to 6, anything. But let's say I place a 4 there as green. Now in order for another die to be placed in that spot, it has to be greater than or equal to, to the dice before it. So the second die has to be a 4, a 5 or a 6. So let's say I place 4 and a 5 there in my turn. That means that yellow can only place a die in that spot if it's 5 or 6. So placing the six in one of these spaces can really limit where, whether people can go on that space or not. For every dice you place down there, you get a single ore resource. So you can tell that ore is harder to get hold of than fuel. Moving to the left, the colony constructor. Simple enough, like the orbital market, you need to have three dice that equal the same value. So three fours, three threes, three twos, etc. It just requires one more die than the orbital market did. When you place your dice here, you pay three ore and construct a colony, which goes on the planet, which I'll get onto in a minute. Moo, shaky, shaky, shaky. There we go. So the colonist hub. Two of the rows are currently covered up for a two player game. With the colonist hub, every time you place a die there, you, you can only place your colored die on one row, so you can only have one uh, row going at a time. And you place one of your colonies, these little doing things, on that spot for the first dice. Every subsequent die you place shifts that colony one space. So if I place three die there, it shifts three spaces effectively. Once it gets all the way to the end over here, you can play a fuel and one ore to place that colony down on the moon in the center. This is like the sort of uh, way that you dump the rest of your dice that you haven't used for other stations, but it's also a cheap way, oops, sorry about that. This is also a cheap way of getting colonies onto the planets because obviously free ore and free dice of the same value is quite expensive to get the colony constructor to do your thing. So this is like the, the other way of doing it. It just takes a bit more time. Now, lastly, for the stations, 
There we go. We have the shipyard. Shipyard, again, spaces are covered up for a two player game. You need two dice of the same value. And what you do here, if I just place two fours there for example, the f you can construct more ships, which are the dice that normally, actually, if, if I put these in the maintenance bay and use yellow, that might make a bit more sense. This is where you can build more ships that are normally in the maintenance bay. So for your, you normally start off with three ships. For your fourth ship, you pay one fuel and one ore and construct the fourth dice, which goes into your stockpile. For the fifth ship, it costs two of each. For the sixth ship, it costs three of each. So it gets more expensive as time goes on, but it's really important in this game to have some ships in your arsenal because if you try to do the whole game with three ships, you're going to suffer compared to somebody who's going around with five or six constantly. So now I'm going to move on to the moon in the center. This is a similar idea to the other stations. This is where your colonies will go. So if I get a few of these domes here, for example, you'll place colonies in each of these spots and control is given to whoever obviously has the most colonies of their color in that spot. To go over briefly what happens when you do control these areas is that you get the special ability of that area as well as victory points. For every colony you place down on the board, you get one victory point. And for every district that you control, you gain another victory point. If somebody takes control of an area away from you, they gain the victory point, you lose it. So victory points are always going up and down on a crazy basis. Now, if I move these out of the way, going through each one very quickly in sort of brief description, Herbert Valley means that you subtract one fuel and ore from the cost of building a ship in the shipyard. The Badlands means that for every die you place in the solar converter, you get an extra fuel. Highland Plains means that you always trade on the orbital market for one for one. So one fuel equals one ore. Very handy. Pole Foothills. The alien tech cards that I mentioned before. If I grab one for an example. Whoop. There we go. Hopefully that will whoop, hopefully that will focus on there for you. There we go. They, some of them have a fuel cost, so this one, pay fuel equal to the number of colonies on the territory to use that territory's bonus. Now, when that happens, you have to pay the cost, obviously, and you can only do it once in the turn. The pole foothills allows you to subtract one from the cost that is printed on the card. The Van Vocht Mountains allow you to place whatever value die you like as your first die on the Lunar Mine. So even if the opponent has put a 6 on there, you could still put a 1 as your next die and then continue the sequence. The Bradbury Plateau down there means that it only costs you 2 ore rather than 3 to build through the colony constructor. And finally, the Asimov Crater, oh no, sorry, not finally, second from last, the Asimov Crater. This means that when you place 2 dice on the colonist hub, you're, you get an extra, di um, extra space worth of movement for the colonist that, sorry, the colony that you constructed. So, as I said before, for every die you placed on, you normally moved it one space. So if you wanted to move it three spaces, you had to put three dice on there. The Asimov Crater effectively speeds up the process and means that you only have to put two die on there to move it three spaces. Quite a useful one to have. And then finally, the Burroughs Desert in the center. The Burroughs Desert is the special relic ship that is found in the crater on the center of the moon. Whoever controls that area can pay one fuel and ore and take the relic ship and put it in their own stockpile. So when they're rolling for a turn, it's an extra die for them to use. Very nice to have. However, it does come undo basically you know, a lot of contention because as soon as you lose control, you lose the relic ship. So naturally, people are going to want to try and steal this off you. So that's basically a brief description of how the areas on the board work. So. Without further ado, I shall just quickly mention the Alien Tech cards. Let's grab one from the top there. The Tech cards. The top ability, so most of them have, some of them only have one ability, but a lot of them will have two, like an or, basically, in the middle. The top part is what you can do on your turn whenever. 
So in this case, once a turn, I can pay a fuel to add one point to one of my unplaced ships. So I could change a two into a three, uh, a four into a five, that kind of thing. Very useful. However, going back, I don't know why I shipped it away from the camera. The bottom part is what you can do. You can once on your turn, discard a card and use the second ability, which tends to be a bit more powerful. Now the IP and the R represent special generator models that you can put on the board and they do different things. The P, Pos Positron one I think it's called, uh, grants an extra victory point if you control the area. The I, um, I'm not sure what it stands for, I think it's a mobilizer or something like that. Um, but, oh, isolation field, sorry. That means that you cannot use the special ability of the area that is there regardless of who controls it. And the R, the repulsive field, means that nobody can take away or place colonies on that area. So they have their special uses. That's it for a description of what each area does and what each area of the moon does, what each space station does. So let's get on with a few turns just to show you how the game flow works. Okay, back in front of the camera. Hopefully you can hear me fine. So I'm now going to run through, say, two or three turns a piece and show you how the game progresses. Now, the game play sort of rinse and repeats, you know, each turn is relatively the same. It's just a case of deciding where your piece, dice are going to go. And I've just noticed we have a colony there that shouldn't be there. So let's take that one off the board. So we're going to kickstart with yellow. Yellow takes his three dice and rolls them. Now, you may or may not be able to see what's on the face value of the die from that angle, but I will tell you as I go through. Yellow has managed to roll three fives. Not a bad start. Great if you wanted to use the colony constructor. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any ore. So what instead uh, yellow is going to do is prepare for building more ships. So first, he's going to need some fuel. So he decides to put a five here in the solar converter, which gets him free fuel. He's then also going to put a five over here in the lunar mine so he can get some ore in preparation. However, he thinks, mm, I could do with some more ore. You know, it's nice to have more of it. So maybe I'll have more. So he's going to stick a second five down there, which he's allowed to do because it's equal to or greater than his last one, and gain two ore. When you resolve the dice on your turn, you can resolve them in any order. So I could do this one first and then the solar converter. Or I could do the solar and then the mine. Most of the time it doesn't make much difference. However, you might want to acquire the resources before you do the ones that involve you spending them for obvious reasons. So reaching into the box here at the top. Um, actually, I'm going to shift this down. There we go, a little bit that way. There we go, move the tokens. So in this case, he gets two ore and he gets free fuel. He puts them in his stockpile, and that's his turn over. Let's move him over to here. There we go. Okay, now green is going to take his turn. Six, five, and a one. Now, you will notice the yellow die are still remaining on the board. That's because you do not take them off until that player has their next turn because the dice block other players. Hence, worker placement. You've seen that many a time, I suspect. Now, 6, 5, and the 1, green already has a fuel token. So it gives him a slight, um, slight balance for the fact that he didn't go first. But he, I bet he wishes he did at this point. So what he's going to do is that he could do with some ore as well. So he's going to place his 5. In fact, no, he's going to place his 6 on the lunar mine. The idea being that when it's yellow's turn, he'll take his dice back and then this will move along and six is the new number there. So that means that yellow would have to place a six on the lunar mine to use it again. And that can be a right pain. Now, for the rest of his go, he is going to place the five on the solar converter as well to get free fuel. Never hurts to have a fair bit of fuel. And then unlike the yellow player who had two on the lunar mine, he's going to get started on building a colony. He's going to place one of his die there. So he gets one ore, he gets free fuel, and he gets one of his cool little colony hubs in construction. The colonist hub moves to the front first spot on that track, and he gets these resources. So now, moving back to yellow. Yellow takes his dice off the board, that shifts forward, and 
that comes off the board there. Roll three die, rinse and repeat. Two, two, and a five. Well, that's quite a prophetic roll, actually, because I wanted to explain this bit. He now has two of the same number and feels that he wants to have more ships. With the two twos, he is able to place these in the shipyard over here because they required equal value. So two, two. So uh, he will build a fourth ship. Now the five has limitations. He could go and get more fuel, but he doesn't desperately need that much more fuel. He can't go to the Raiders outpost because there's no sequential order. He could go here and cycle the cards, but that's about all he could do with the alien tech. He hasn't got enough dice for the auto market or the colonist construction, and it's not a six, so he can't use the terraforming station. So with his remaining five, he's gonna go onto the next track on the colonist hub and begin construction there. So he places his yellow colony here, and then he builds for, if I get to his fuel, one ore and one fuel. However, that is what the ship would normally cost. However, he's going to do something a bit different. This is where the alien tech cards come in handy. The data crystal that I showed you earlier may hopefully focus, may not. But basically it says at the top, pay fuel equal to the cost or equal to the colonies on the particular area on the board, the moon, that is, the moon in the center there, and use its ability regardless of whether you have the control of it or not. This is quite a powerful tech card to have at the start of the game because there's obviously no colonies on the planet yet. But it obviously gets a lot more expensive as the game progresses. Now what the yellow player is going to do is that he's going to utilize Herbert Valley. There's no colonies on that area so it doesn't cost him anything to use the card. But he's going to use the ability where it costs one less fuel and one less ore to build a ship. So he can take those back and just get a fourth ship for free. Quite a useful use of his alien tech card. At the end of his turn, his dice remain. Green takes back his dice. One, two, and three. And it's now Green's go again. Three, three, four. Now, this is where Green's a little bit annoyed because he could have gone and built a ship now. Unfortunately, Yellow has stolen the station space that is there. Obviously, there's more spaces in more player games. But with two players, there's only one, and yellow has nicked it. So, green can't build himself a ship this turn. What a shame, eh? What a shame. But, oh well, no worries about that. There are other things that green can start getting on with. So, what the green is going to decide to do is he believes that he could probably do with getting a colony on the planet as quickly as humanly possible, and he has enough resources that he can pretty much deal with the costs of building anything in the near future. So he's going to stick all three of his ships on the colonist hub. All three of them. This moves his colony on here. One, two, three spaces. So he's well on the way to getting his first colony on the board. Now I'm going to fast forward to a little bit later in the game to where colonies are about to be placed on the moon because as you can see the goes are fairly similar between turns. You know you will roll the die and you will place them on the station. So hopefully you've got that under your belt now. I want to explain more facts about the game as to when you get like control of planets and victory conditions that kind of thing. So I'm going to fast forward to a little bit later in the game. <laughs> Okay, later on in the game, you will notice that the colonies on this track have moved further forward. And what has happened is that Green now has four ships to play with. He managed to get his fourth ship built. But Yellow has five ships to play with. He was able to construct a fifth ship during the term. Now, they've each got a certain amount of resources apiece. I'm now going to continue the game from this point. So I can go into a bit more detail about sticking the colonies on the actual planets. So... Let's give yellow first dibs. Six, six, four, two, three. Now, this is an interesting one. What the yellow player is going to do is first, he is going to place two sh ships over here on the six because he's going to try and build another ship, the sixth ship. Why not? But he could also do with replenishing his resources. So he's going to use the Raider's Outpost over here with his 2, 3, and 4. Placing them there. 
Now with the shipyard, he's going to use his data crystal from earlier to utilize the Herbert Valley bonus. That means that it only costs him two ore and two fuel to build the ship. One, two, one, two, into the box. There's his sixth ship, it's all good. Now the Raiders Outpost allows him to steal either four resources from the other player or steal one of his alien tech cards. Now, what I think the, now he has a choice. I mean, there are a lot of resources there and he could get a lot, a lot of them from the green player. However, for the purposes that I actually want the green player to have some resources to do what he needs to do for putting colonies down, I'm going to choose to steal one of his tech cards. He has a booster pod in his collection, which allows him to add one to the face value of an unplaced ship. Luck mitigation in this game is very useful on these alien tech cards, so don't knock them. So he's going to steal the tech card itself. So now he has it in his collection. Greens go. Four ships. Roll. Three, three, one, five. Okay. So we only need one die over here to get the colony on the planet. So let's put the titchy little one over there. That would probably be the best bet. Unfortunately, green can't build a ship because yet again, yellow has knocked him off the spot. He's really not liking this uh, idea that yellow keeps nicking his spot. Ah, well, needs must. He's got a fair amount of ore, so he's not too fast. He could do with a bit more fuel though. So I think he's going to place the three over here to get a couple more fuel. But what he would like now is an alien tech card to basically mitigate the fact that he's just lost one. So he's going to take his five and a three and place it on the alien artifact base. Now to resolve the dice, he's going to first start off with the solar converter. So two fuel. Now at the moment, green has in his stockpile four fuel and four ore. Now, if you ever end up with more than eight resources of any t of a mixture of types in your area, you have to discard down to eight resources. You can never hoard more than eight. Now, He's looking at these tech cards at the top of the screen, which I'll bring onto the board. There we go. And deciding whether he wants any particular, basically, you know, any particular tech. He thinks that he's going to have Temporal Warper in the middle there. The Temporal Warper allows him to pay one fuel to re-roll any quantity of his unplaced ships. A third tech card is placed to replace the one that he's just taken. And he takes this one into his area. Finally, he has the colony hub over here. It moves to the last spot and then he pays one fuel and one ore to build the colony itself. It then goes on the moon on any district he feels like. So it depends what special ability he wants to make use of, whether he wants his uh, hubs to go quicker, cheaper colonies, uh, better trading, more power, cheaper ships, that kind of thing. There's all sorts of things that he could choose. What he's going to choose though, is that he is going to make a start with the pole foothills. I think he's gonna go for that one. Pole foothills allows him to spend one less fuel to use his alien tech cards. He's just picked up one that requires him to use one fuel and his other one here from the start requires him to pay free fuel. So he thinks that they're getting a bit expensive and he thinks he's gonna reduce the cost down a bit. By placing the colony on the board, he gains one victory point. Because he also controls that area, because nobody else is contesting it, he gains another victory point. So it's a two point gain. Now, obviously, if yellow stuck a colony on the same district, yellow would get a victory point for his colony being there, but he would also get, sorry, he would green would lose a victory point for losing control of the area, because in order to control an area, you must have more colonies of your color than your opponent. That's greens go. Let's move back onto yellow. Five, five, four, six, one. Okay, fair enough. Yellow is also going to start getting colonies on the planet, so he's going to use two dice to do that. However, he's going to be mean and he's going to head over to the Raiders outpost again. So four, five, six, four, five, six. Now, in order, he's first going to do the Raiders outpost, but instead of stealing the tech card, he's going to steal resources from the green player. So green's got this nice collection of resources here and yellow is deciding to rid of all his ore and one of his energy. Ouch. 
into the stockpile it goes for yellow. Now yellow also moves his colony hub two spaces because he plays two dice there and gets to the end by paying one fuel and one ore courtesy of the green player. Green is not happy. Yellow decides to place his colony on the board. Now the yellow player also has tech cards that require fuel for the cost so he's thinking that maybe the pole foothill would be good for him to have. However you only get the special ability if you control the area so it's not the best, it's not going to help that he goes there to contest it so he thinks that he's just going to go onto another area and just get the ability permanently. But then he has a think, he's got the data crystal in his possession which allows him to use any bonus if he spends a fuel per colony on it. So if he places more colonies on different districts he's just making life a bit more expensive for himself and also he doesn't need to have a colony on there because he can just use the data crystal. So he's going to give green even more hard time and actually contest his pole foothills. By going there yellow gets a victory point for placing a colony on the board but because green no longer has control of the area green loses his victory point for control and now they're both on one victory point each. You have to be able to keep track of these victory points as you go along because you have to make certain that they're fair obviously and keep track of when they keep going up and down. However it's relatively easy to look at the board and go right green has say six colonies on the board and he controls two districts therefore at base value he should at least have eight victory points not including tech cards. So it's relatively straightforward to total up the points as you go along and make sure that you haven't miscounted. So that's generally Alien Frontiers. I've gone through what each station and district on the, air, on the board means. I have also done some sample turns of when you are mainly starting off and going around the edge. I have also just gone through a brief description of how the colonies end up on the planet. Now bearing in mind obviously the colony constructor, the terraforming station and the colonist hub are your main ways of getting colonies on the planet. And eventually you're going to have all these colonies everywhere and you're going to be contesting, 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 you know, and basically trying to gain control of the board and get the most victory points. The game goes on in this way until one player has got his last colony on the board. The second he does that, the game ends. There's no extra turn for the opponents, no like finishing the round or anything. The second that colony goes on the board, the game ends. So there's a random end game trigger, which is one of the things I like about this game. But you have to keep an eye on your opponent to see if he's trying to rush to get his colonies out. Because if he is, you better make certain that you're ahead of him on points before the game finishes. Once the game finishes, you tally up all your victory points depending on what you control, what alien tech cards you've got, and, what and obviously all your colonies on the board. And the player with the most victory points is the winner. Simple as that. So there you go, that's my brief how to play tutorial of how to play Alien Frontiers the 4th edition. I hope that has been informative to you and you can have a, you've got a sort of idea as to whether you would like this type of game or it helps you to play your first game with your friends, your loved one, whichever you're playing this game with. This is the two player variant I have shown you. The only main differences between a three and a four player is that certain spaces obviously open up on the board so there's more areas of the dice to go. Uh, you will start off with less colonies with more players because it has to obviously not extend the game length to a stupid level. Although there is a long variant where you can extend the length to by having all your colonies regardless of the number of players. I don't recommend that. I think you should always stick to the book by where you get all eight of them. I think it's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, sorry, nine. Where you get all your colonies in a two player game and then one less than that in a three and two less than that in a four. I recommend you always stick to that condition because it just makes certain that the game doesn't get to stupid lengths. Other than that, the only other difference I believe with a three or four player, no, I don't believe there is. It's just what colonies you start off with and how the board opens up. So I hope you enjoyed it. That's Alien Frontiers 4th Edition, the how to play tutorial. Uh, my next video is going to be based on Kingsburg so that you can compare the two and see which one you would prefer. Because I mean, I own both games and I enjoy both games, but hopefully a how to play of each of the games will help you to make up some idea of which game you would like more. Hopefully I will get a Kingsburg review up in the sort of late in maybe the early part of July, maybe the later part of June, 
to illustrate that point even further. So that's it from me for now. I'll see you on the next how to play video for the broken people.